How's that? Perfect. Good. Tell me when you're ready to go, Mike. Uh, I guess I'm ready. All right. So welcome everybody back to the um, Western Hemisphere Colloquium on Geometry and Physics. We're very pleased today to have Mike Douglas from CMSA at Harvard, as well as Stony Brook. And he'll be talking to us about how will we do mathematics in 2030? Mike. Uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks uh, for the uh, invitation. So uh, I have given this talk uh, many times, and this is now a uh, semi-revised version of the talk. So uh, it has uh, many updated things, uh, but there may also be some uh, hiccups in the slides, but hopefully not. So here we, okay. Let me uh, see if I can, uh, I think I'm better off putting this full screen and then resharing it actually. Let me, Mike, you're okay if people jump in with questions during the talk? Oh, we'll yeah, yeah. Q and A afterwards as well. Yeah. There we go. That way I can uh, advance the slides with the arrow. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, you know this uh, you know very broad question, mostly about the uh, impact of. Uh, computational technologies, but uh, you know, I, I think it's better to frame the question uh, differently. You know, there's, you know, many advances in technologies and in particular uh, computation breaks up into many things. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion of machine learning and I'll have a lot of discussion of that, but that's only one of the many computational technologies. And I think, I think it's better to set the discussion in this kind of broader historical context. So, uh, to uh, start, I'll really uh, you know give a very very brief uh, overview of uh, the history of uh, you know computation, uh, computer science in the twentieth twenty uh, first uh, century, and uh, then uh, you know, again we've already advanced a huge amount, and it's had a you know remarkable impact on the questions we ask, how we do mathematical sciences, math, uh, physics, and so forth. And uh, so, you know, again, to set it in perspective, you know, we can get a better sense of what might come. So, uh, yeah, as, as you know, the original, you know, vision of, of computation was was rather uh, prosaic. You know, it grew out of things like, uh, you know, you know, punch card looms and uh, doing the census and uh, calculating uh, trajectories of uh, artillery shells and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, you know, there was a you know certainly a more visionary uh, theoretical concept due to uh, people like uh, Turing and others. And uh, once uh, computers were actually built, you know, the size of electronic computers that uh, could do real calculations, uh, people very quickly in the '50s saw that th this was much broader than just a, a calculator. And uh, some of the uh, pioneers that uh, you know, first uh, discussed these ideas. So Vannevar Bush, uh, maybe not most familiar name these days, but re really uh, foresaw in, in many ways, uh, if not the internet, certainly the uh, information storage and retrieval and search aspects of the uh, internet. Uh, this word of cybernetics, which was due to Norbert Wiener and, uh, you know, again, many people working on control theory and uh, putting, uh, you know, computational systems in a, a control loop. Artificial intelligence uh, goes back to uh, the pioneers, uh, Newell and Simon at uh, Carnegie Mellon, John McCarthy, Martin Mis Marvin Minsky. Uh, this phrase, natural computing, which uh, was, uh, you know, again, a little, little old fashioned and referred to a, a, a wide variety of uh, ways to do computation inspired by uh, the natural world, perhaps biology, perhaps uh, physics. 
uh, Holland was uh, one of the pioneers of genetic algorithms, so by, by evolution. And all these are very rich, uh, at the very least, analogies, and, and, and far more than uh, analogies we see. They really are you know, deep you know, aspects of both the, you know, the science, where you, you're better off thinking computationally, and of course, uh, you know, vice versa. And uh, so uh, for purposes of this talk, you know, of course, this, you know, sets many of the concepts. And there was, you know, again, you know, many, many good ideas that uh, could not really realize their fruition for, for, for many decades, you know, partly because, uh, compu you know, computers, of course, uh, became, you know, exponentially more powerful, and, and partly because even basic ideas such as uh, the uh, exponential nature of an undirected uh, search were not, you know, fully appreciated at this very early day. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, again, for example, if you ask about symbolic uh, algebra, you know, of course, this goes back to uh, the uh, Lisp programming language was the first place where this was implemented, and it was written for uh, artificial intelligence purposes by the, that, that community. So uh, so then, uh, 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 again, this very broad brush uh, history, the next technological leap of comparable magnitude was the uh, internet. And uh, the uh, story I uh, always tell in this uh, talk, you know, from my own and from you know, many of, of, of your experience in our community, uh, theoretical physics, and we went, you know, from uh, paper preprints in the 80s to uh, the archive in the early 90s. And uh, when I was a grad student at Caltech in the 80s, we would uh, basically uh, keep up with the preprints by uh, mail delivery every uh, couple of weeks. You know, we would get a uh, box of uh, preprints and, uh, you know, eagerly look through them. And uh, at, th at that time, this was the first super string revolution. And uh, there was many uh, developments, but the center of the field was indisputably uh, Princeton and the Institute for Advanced Study. And so, you know, we would, we would eagerly read these preprints and uh, come up with uh, questions and ideas and discuss and start trying to work. And then the next box of preprints would come and the things move so quickly that often, you know, the ideas we had, even the questions we had would already be uh, worked out. And uh, it, was, it was frustrating. And uh, the second super string revolution of the uh, 90s, the duality revolution worked very differently. You know, it started, you know, really, I think Ashok Sen, if we have to, uh, you know, put, you know, credit one person, I think that's, that's entirely, uh, you know, fair. And uh, he, he was working almost alone on this in uh, India. And uh, this time, Sen and many other researchers could keep up with the revolution. And it, it, there were really contributions from around the world. And the, the source of that is, 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 is totally clear. It was uh, the internet and, you know, in particular, the archive here. And uh, of course, the internet has made many, many things possible. And we probably haven't even seen the, the, the end of it. But another very relevant uh, success story for this talk is uh, Wikipedia, which uh, is another thing which surprised people back uh, when the idea was, you know, the first uh, pages were written in the early 2000s. Most people did not think that a uh, interesting uh, resource would uh, come out of this. You know, they looked at the history of encyclopedias, which were, uh, you know, produced by publishers with uh, a hierarchical staff of uh, editors and uh, guest editors and experts and so forth. And uh, Wikipedia does have editors in hierarchy, but but relatively few, you know, compared to uh, what a traditional encyclopedia used or what one might have predicted. And it, it works again. Not, not, it's not the panacea, but it works much better than one would think. So now we're in this uh, phase of uh, machine learning, which I don't need to uh, review the. Uh, broad impact that uh, this is starting to have. It's still, again, you know, there, there have been very, very incredible discoveries, which we will talk about. And, and I think the, the impact of this on life is only starting to take place. Uh, certainly for you know, those of us, uh, say, in our field looking for you know, industrial or you know, more applied work, to, it's already had a huge impact because uh, Google and the industrial lives have hired thousands of uh, you know, with mathematical sciences of all sorts. And uh, in this talk, we're really not gonna focus on machine learning 
as a, a subject, but rather this question, you know, how would we use it to help us as mathematical scientists to do our research or to uh, teach or to communicate or the other aspects of our jobs? Okay, so uh, here's where I uh, diverge from previous uh, versions of the talk. There's a you know, interesting and uh, you know, somewhat lengthy discussion I gave about uh, mathematical search engines to bring people into the sort of general questions that uh, this, this area entertains. But I've, I've decided to uh, instead focus on uh, more recent developments of which there are you know, very many interesting ones. But let me uh, then turn to, you know, to, to finish up this somewhat historical part of the uh, talk. Uh, of course, you know, computational mathematics existed long before electronic or mechanical computers. And, uh, you know, people like uh, Euler and Gauss and uh, Ramanujan were, of course, uh, renowned for these abilities, which uh, really were how huge amounts of mathematics, uh, you know, the, you know, things were discovered, the conjectures were made and so forth. And uh, so from that point of view, computers are just, again, doing what people have always done and perhaps doing in some ways better, you know, in some ways faster and so forth. And uh, in the, uh, you know, previous uh, century, there were many, in fact, fields opened up by the ability to do a numerical calculations, the whole field of uh, dynamical systems, although some of the concepts were suggested, for example, by Poincaré, it was very difficult to uh, do anything with those concepts without actual, you know, examples and uh, you know, examples mostly constructed by numerical integration. If you look at the uh, con constructions of sporadic finite uh, simple groups, these are uh, the, the large ones are all based on uh, computer calculations. The birch swinnerton dyer conjecture, one of the uh, clay millennial problems was in fact uh, the uh, you know, extrapolation from uh, computer calculations done in the uh, 50s and 60s by birch and swinnerton dyer. And uh, this, this tradition certainly uh, continues. So uh, to uh, you know, now turn towards you know, this you know, 2030, where, where are things going? Uh, clearly computers are getting faster. Moore's law, you can debate whether Moore's law still, still holds. In fact, the, the scaling of the chips actually went quite a bit uh, longer than anybody would have foreseen. And uh, even when you can't uh, reduce feature sizes of chips, as long as you can make the chips more cheaply, then you can take uh, more of them together. And uh, then in, 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 in uh, certainly you know, machine learning and uh, related fields, there's been a, a super Moore's law in the sense that the industrial labs invested vast uh, funds into uh, acquiring GPUs and uh, fast uh, computers. So, uh, so this is you know the, the, the safest prediction of the talk. I think that you know this is now you know eight years from now. You know we 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 still have uh, you know we we will gain a, at least a factor of a thousand and probably more in the computing time available for these things. Okay, so now now to get into a uh, you know more more substantive uh, you know again development. This is just illustrating a lot of sort of. Uh, solvers in that 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 computers people have uh, developed uh, for a variety of purposes and uh, so I'll, I'll talk about the uh, sat solvers so sat is solving problems in uh, propositional logic now I'll, I'll talk a bit about the others and uh, there's a uh, very you know nice example illustrating this from about uh, five years ago by uh, Hoyle et al the solution of what's called the uh, boolean pythagorean triple problem so you take uh, the uh, consecutive integers from a one to n. And the question is, can you color these in two ways? Let's say red and blue, so that uh, no Pythagorean triple is all red or all blue. And uh, so, uh, you know, not, so not very obvious how you would attack this problem analytically. It's just very intricate combinatorics. And it's been exhibited such a uh, split for one through seven, eight, two, four. And there is a proof that there is no such split for a 7825. And uh, this was done by a, a SAT solver. And the proof is, in fact, uh, something like a 200 terabytes long. So at the time, and I think it's not even anymore, it was longest proof. 
So, so, so what is, how is this done? Okay, well, a SAT solver solves lists of Boolean propositions. You have variables, you can combine those with a and, or, and not. And the question is, can you satisfy an uh, entire set of such uh, propositions at the same time with some variable assignment? And uh, so here, what would we do? We would uh, represent for each of the uh, numbers, the integers one through n, we would have a Boolean variable and uh, the uh, values true and false might correspond to the colors red and blue. And uh, then for each of the uh, Pythagorean triples ABC, we could translate that into a uh, propositional expression in terms of the three variables associated to A, B, and C, such that the expression is true if, uh, again, the coloring constraint is satisfied and, and, and false if it's uh, not. So, so then one does get a list of propositions, which is uh, you know, of order, you know, I don't know, you know, you know, close to a million such uh, propositions. But that's well within the range of these uh, stat solvers. They can handle systems of, of millions, but not billions, but uh, millions of uh, such constraints. And uh, not only, well, you know, again, the challenging thing from some point of view is to produce a certificate of proof that uh, the solution does not exist. And uh, the, the, again, as part of these systems, there's usually what's done by what's called resolution proving. So, uh, so uh, you notice that this problem, of course, wasn't in the first instance, I mean, except in the sense that all problems involve uh, logic, but it wasn't formulated in terms of Boolean logic. It was formulated in terms of uh, number theory, you know, integer equations. And uh, a more general type of solver is called a SMT, satisfiability modulo theories, where you combine some kind of simple type of system of equations with equality. It might be uh, just addition, it might be uh, you know, linear, algebra and so forth with the uh, SAT solver. And so there are such systems. The, uh, there's a group in Waterloo that has what they call SAT plus CAS, where you can basically generate all of your statements by working through equations with a computer algebra system automatically. So that would be a very efficient way of uh, deriving the uh, clauses. Of course, in this problem, it's relatively simple. But if your conditions were more complicated, then you might, well, you know, appreciate that that simplification. And then some of the problems that uh, this group has uh, worked on include uh, what's called the uh, Williamson's conjecture. So this is the question, do there exist four symmetric n by n matrices with uh, plus or minus one entries that satisfy this kind of uh, a quaternionic or four square condition. And uh, strangely enough, they exist for all even n up to the number they checked, which was a 70 and all n less than 35 and not, for example, for n equals 35. So there, I don't think there's any, at the time there was no conjecture as to what's the pattern that might you know, govern the existence of these solutions. Another one, which uh, in fact, uh, just in the last uh, weeks, this uh, deserves uh, updating. They had results for the problem of finding an efficient way to do three by three matrix multiplication. And uh, at the time, the record was uh, 23, where the naive algorithm would be uh, 27. And in fact, there have a, 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 there's whole talks about this. This is a famous problem in computer science. The asymptotic number is believed to be n to the two plus epsilon, though this is far out of reach at the moment. And uh, just again in the last uh, weeks, uh, DeepMind, uh, I believe, has found a way of doing this with a uh, 22 again by uh, computer uh, reinforcement learning search. So, uh, so that's a, a symbolic type of uh, method. And uh, now uh, let's let's look at some examples of applications of, of machine learning to again to. You know, in some sense, you know, I mean, alpha fold. It is, it is uh, you know, computational biology and you know, you know, physical chemistry. But uh, let's look at uh, you know, pure mathematics, uh, theoretical physics, that that sort of thing. So uh, this is a uh, slide that was produced by OpenAI. I should probably move this earlier in the talk to uh, illustrate this point that I made that uh, the uh, speed up in uh, since you know 2012 as it may I'm, I'm not sure how clear this slide is but in 2012 was this famous uh, AlexNet that is you know it's considered the beginning of the deep learning era and uh, the uh, 
amount of compute that was put into training these are machine learning models shows a sudden discontinuity there. This just reflects this, this both great interest and great investment in, in computers to do this sort of thing. Uh, let me, uh, again, many will know this, but just to uh, you know, review. So, so there are generally three uh, standard paradigms of uh, machine learning that are called unsupervised, uh, supervised, and the reinforcement learning. And they'll talk about examples of all of those. And uh, the supervised learning is the simplest, where you have a uh, labeled data. So in the case, in the middle picture here, we might have uh, Xs and Os. So that's the label. We know when a data point is an X or an O. And then the uh, square represents uh, features. Uh, the X and Y axis might be the value of uh, you know, various measurements that we make about uh, the uh, data point. And then the goal is to perhaps classify it. Is it an X? Is it an O? Perhaps it's to predict or do something else. But in any case, we're given these labels. And so mathematically, it's really function fitting, interpolation and extrapolation. Uh, on the uh, left, the uh, unsupervised learning has data items with uh, features, so the interpretation of the position in the square is essentially the same. We have you know various uh, you know coordinates on this graph representing uh, you know aspects of the uh, data item or, or, or components of a vector. But now we're not given when we see the uh, color on this diagram. We're actually not given that the uh, computer just has to somehow infer from the uh, position and the embedding in this input space, what's well, likely to be similar to a what. And so here it's guessed that there are these uh, three clouds of uh, green, blue, red, which seem uh, you know, very intuitive, although some of these points in the middle, of course, you could, you could debate. And of course, if there's a, un, a, a ground truth in underlying classification, it might or might not have a lot to do with this. But uh, this is a very powerful technique because you obviously you know, don't need labels. And then on the right, reinforcement learning, the picture here has a rather different meaning. This is what's used in, in, in playing games, learning to play a game, for example. This is a uh, Markov uh, decision process with uh, states and uh, transitions. And for example, a game you might learn when, when you're in a given situation, you know, it's best to do, you know, move, move up, say, from the middle is the most rewarding option. Okay, so, so we have those uh, various uh, paradigms of uh, machine learning and uh, the you know sort of core technology that that goes in you know it's certainly a defining thing of deep learning and what goes into much of this is a feed forward neural network which I'm not I'm not going to review in detail I, I would imagine uh, you know everyone here has seen multiple talks uh, describing those although again mathematically quite simple and uh, you know not not that hard to uh, you know to go and uh, look up. Uh, so the just one of the main distinctions now between uh, ma ma you know, machine learning as it's uh, you know, broadly used by uh, engineers and computer scientists and the rest and, and the uh, applications to the mathematical sciences is that there's a much greater scope for working with what we could call a synthetic data where the data set is not something that we uh, observe or measure. It's either something that we uh, simulate by following, for example, equations of motion, or really in mathematics, you know, by literal construction. And it, we'll, we'll talk about, for example, you know, looking at the data set of uh, knots and uh, knot invariants. So there, it is a data set. You know, there is just a long, infinite, you know, arbitrarily long list of the you know, a finite subset of the infinite set of uh, knots, but it's clearly a very special data set, you know, that data set will remain what it is uh, forever. The only choice was which knots out of the infinite set did you take? You know, if you take, you know, everything up to 20 crossings, that is a well-defined mathematical object. And I, 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 I've used the term a uh, platonic data set to uh, refer to uh, these, that uh, it's a, it is a data set, but it's a data set with its own independent definition. And uh, so here's the uh, three lines from the uh, knot data set that uh, we, we've got uh, knots in the left-hand column. And uh, now I've broken down knot invariants into uh, two uh, classes here. 
there is uh, algebraic invariance, such as the uh, Jones polynomial, where we can, you know, have an algorithm involving, uh, you know, crossings and uh, scan relations and the like. And uh, then there are geometric invariants, which uh, can have uh, a variety of types, you know, for example, transcendence, but, uh, you know, also invariants that, you know, look at the hyperbolic manifold you get by, you know, S3, uh, you know, taking out the uh, not. And uh, so very interesting, you know, could be a talk on its own. Work from uh, this January of uh, DeepMind, uh, Alex Davies et al, that uh, basically fit, you know, the, 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 this table, the way that you might do uh, data mining and, and some other subject. Let's feed in, say, all of the uh, geometric invariants as the uh, input in supervised learning and try to predict one of the algebraic invariants as uh, the uh, output of the uh, supervised learning. And in fact, they were able to uh, get a, a bound on the uh, signature, which uh, Mark Lackenby was able to uh, prove. And you know, very, again, very instructive paper. The, the first conjecture that they came up with by looking at these fits was not right. You know, they, they then tried to falsify it and uh, came up with a refined conjecture, which was able to prove. Uh, another, uh, you know, again, the one behind uh, the uh, Birch Swinerton dyer and, and, and now available as the LNFDB, the uh, you know, many number theoretic data sets there include the uh, data sets of uh, elliptic curves. And uh, the Birch Swinerton dyer conjecture actually is what we would call trivial machine learning these days in the sense that uh, if you look at uh, the uh, conjecture, so they're expressing this, uh, well, you know, the order of vanishing of an L function and then the uh, coefficient in terms of these, uh, you know, variants of, of the elliptic curve. This is a multiplicative relation. So if, if you have a table of these things and you take uh, logarithms, you're, you're doing just linear regression. And uh, so, you know, you, you, of course, you know, computers in the uh, 50s and 60s, you know, it was amazing that they could you know, do anything like this, but uh, you know, and, and, and again, this is this is sort of the you know the chapter two of a machine learning textbook, but you know again, very you know deep uh, conjecture that came out of it. Uh, another example, uh, very recent uh, work. This was a group of uh, Princeton, uh, Flatiron, uh, some other places. Uh, a, a way of predicting uh, instability or stability of exoplanetary uh, solar systems. So. Uh, this is it, 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 very, very interesting. Uh, you know, again, you know, you know, one could give most of a talk about this. Our solar system is actually not stable. So it, 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 the answer to the you know, question of, uh, you know, Newton and Lagrange and Laplace and the others is, turns out to be, it's not stable. If you, if you simulate it for billions of years and you take, uh, you know, of course there's chaos. So you should look at a variety of slightly different initial conditions. And about 1% of the starting points do lead to a uh, you know, qualitative change, collision, ejection of, of planets and so forth. So, so that's our solar system. And uh, now we've observed uh, you know, many thousands of uh, you know, exo, you know, you know, you know, planets around uh, you know, other stars. And uh, they have wildly differing properties. And of course, you'd like to ask the, the same question for them. How were they created? Are they stable? What is their uh, lifetime? And uh, so this would seem like a natural problem for uh, machine learning. And uh, this is outlining the procedure. They're really the only subtlety. Again, it, it, there is a, you can, you can do simulations and get a labeled data set. You simulate the uh, system for a billion years and see was it stable over a billion years. And uh, then the goal is to make a classifier which uh, is much faster than that, but you cannot just use the initial conditions as the features because again, the, 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 it, it's chaotic. You know, you really don't know that much about, you know, something, but you don't know enough about the, the uh, trajectory from the initial conditions. But what you can do is you can simulate for some much shorter length of time, you know, let's say 10,000 years instead of a billion years, and uh, then compute, uh, you know, simple, you know, statistics or, you know, you know, some summary of, you know, how, what, what parts of phase space does it move through within these 10,000 years? And then that turns out to be enough data to train, a, again, a supervised uh, learning uh, classifier to, uh, 
distinguish uh, stable and unstable and estimate the lifetime. So, you know, again, you know, well, I mean, this, this is, I mean, from some points of view, I, 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 I mean, it's very interesting to get, you know, analytic insight into these things, but, you know, from some practical point of view, you know, which, which is relevant as well here, you know, perhaps a better solution. Uh, a graphical neural network is something that, uh, well, it's, it's based on a graph and uh, to, to oversimplify, <clears throat> one is allowed to pass messages the data sits on nodes and they communicate by passing messages along these uh, edges and then they can combine on a node and then you know make another round of message passing and usually there are two or three layers of, of, of this process so uh another uh, work of uh you know the uh, flat iron uh, princeton uh, collaboration is uh fitting modifications to the inverse square law of gravity from dark matter simulations. So this was a large uh, database of supercomputer simulations of a cold dark matter cosmology. And uh, the question here, there are many questions, but in particular, can you fit a modified two body law of gravity that takes into account the effect of the uh, dark matter around each of the uh, you know, particles uh, over density or a galaxy? And uh, indeed you can fit a, a good expression and, and this graphical neural network combined with what symbolic regression found a significantly better such uh, fit than the, the original work of the uh, people who did the simulation. Uh, this is a, 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 a paper I wrote uh, last year with uh, Sergey Verschuk, a mathematical economist at the uh, CMSA at uh, Harvard. So it turns out that in economics, there's something called the theory of gravity. And uh, what's that? The you look at you imagine a table of the amount of trade between a pair of countries I and J, and it turns out this is pretty well fit by economic standards by taking uh, the size of the first economy GDP say times the size of the second economy divided by the geographical distance between the uh, two countries, and so this uh, you know you see where the name comes from, and, and this this. Sufficiently good. This, this this attracted a lot of attention, and there's, there's there's been you know you know again thousands of papers over the 60 years since since the original observation, and finding more complicated models, better fits that can depend on more factors, three body effects. So for example, it might be that some third country is very good at producing uh, you know who knows you know shoes or computers or whatever, and because of that you know every other country prefers to trade that item with them and then that that changes as a measurable correction to the relation. And so these are summarized in what are called the market access factors. And uh, this significantly improves the fit. And uh, what we did was we basically did a uh, ab initio. We said, let's take a graphical neural network and let's assume, you know, little, you know, almost nothing about uh, the, the law. We certainly did not assume, uh, you know, the, this form as the leading term, but we fit in the same style as uh, the grammar et al uh, gravity fits in cosmology. And it turns out that uh, this, this produces an even better fit, which you can also use a symbolic regression and you can see this leading term and then you can see market assets factors, which are similar, although in, in, in detail, they, they, are, they are different. We have not, really from an economics point of view understood the, you know, fully the model that we've come out with, but it is it is a relatively simple model. Here are some of the uh, functions that come out of this uh, symbolic regression, you know, there's simple ratios of uh, log, you know, logs of, log of uh, you know, you know, particular constants of, of the, 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 the factors that you would expect in there. Okay, uh, let me, again, this was a, very you know, kind of far ranging survey, but you know some of the uh, you know interesting variations on uh, machine learning in you know mathematical sciences mostly where one can use uh, synthetic data, you know, although in our economic case we use real data, and uh, so of course machine learning it, it came out in many fields, but but perhaps the heart of it is uh, statistics, and uh, just taking this point of view of uh, statistics as being at the uh, central in the mathematical sciences. Well, that was certainly not at all the case when uh, I, again, when I was in graduate school, I didn't even take statistics and <clears throat> nobody, nobody advised me to. And uh, on the other hand, you know, where things have, have, have changed quite a lot and started to change before <clears throat> this uh, deep learning 
revolution. And uh, so uh, again, a whole nother talk one could give, but uh, what I think the, the a, a fair comment to make about it is that statistics brings different general ways of, of trying to solve a problem. And uh, both uh, you could try to solve a mathematical problem by again, looking at an ensemble of the objects, you know, st you know statistics of number of theoretic objects is, is, is certainly a well-studied uh, area. If, if you're analyzing data, of course that, that was statistics, but you have very many more general methods that, that you could try to, to bring to it. And uh, a good example of that is this work of uh, Jesse Taylor et al. from about three years ago. This is the problem of identifying jets in uh, collider physics, which again is a you know, very old problem. There were lots and lots of uh, hand coded uh, you know, algorithm statistics to you know, define what is a jet. You know, there were neural networks you know, fitting you know, jets uh, you know, sort of you know, incur, you know, you know, you know, more ad hoc. But uh, what they did was they said, let's just take the energy deposited over a cylinder, you know, surrounding the, the interaction region, you know, the, the, the direct output uninterpreted of the, uh, you know, our, the calorimeter and the uh, detector. And uh, then we can define the natural distance between energy distributions, this uh, Wasserstein or Earth movers distance, you know, sort of the minimal amount that you would have to move pieces of the first distribution to recreate the second distribution. And then given a distance, you can do a clustering and then you in clustering, they show you can rederive uh, jets and you can even rederive uh, some of the old definitions of jet. So that, that's an example of uh, old problem, it's, it's old statistics, but a new you know, kind of way of looking at it. The, we're not going to just uh, work specifically to this problem. We're going to try to define a distance and then use general methods using that. So that's that's a, a, a philosophy which one sees very much more of. Here's a, a very brief, uh, you know, one slide about a, a probabilistic model of elliptic curves. Coming back to my previous slide that, that predicts that this is from 2013 and then predicts that in fact uh, the uh, infinite series of curves only go up to a uh, rank uh, 21, and so therefore there should only be. You know, there should be a maximal rank elliptic curve, not an obvious statement. And I don't think anybody really claims to know, but but now there, there are there, you know there is a you know a, a good argument in, in, on this side of the question. Okay, so let me, let me see what time it is. Uh, so interactive theorem verification. So this is uh, now if if you haven't seen it, let me uh, also uh, recommend the uh, ICM talk of uh, Kevin Buzzard, who will. Uh, you know, covers this, this you know, I, I will say, you know, different things than he says there, and that is very interesting and up-to-date to discussion. So uh, many of you have probably heard of this at, at this point. So uh, this was a technology that uh, could not automatically prove uh, statements, but uh, verify a statement, perhaps partly automatically generated and uh, partly you know, human generated and much developed in computer science because you would like to prove that the critical programs are correct and do what you expect that they uh, do. And uh, here's an example of it from this uh, software verification field. This is how you would state in the uh, Koch theorem proving language that a program sorts a list. So you define is a sorting algorithm is a function from a list, in this case of natural numbers to another list, which is a permutation and the final list is sorted. And uh, sorted is easy to define, uh, you know, logically, you know, basically you respect, you know, the, the list order respects the, uh, you know, the, the given order on, on the list items. And then there is a simple recursive uh, definition of a permutation where you can append the same element to the beginning of two permutations of a list. You can append two transposed elements. It, it is transitive and so forth. And uh, then this is enough. This, with, with this definition, you can then take a program that does say a quick sort, which is somewhat complicated and tricky, and then improve it really implements this. So let me give a, a mathematical example of this. And uh, this is, the lean theorem proving language, which is the one that uh, you know, Kevin Buzzard has, you know, you know, speaks about and has led to the development of the, the library that I'll, I'll get to in a bit. That, uh, but this is a statement of the fundamental theorem of uh, algebra. 
on the complex numbers that uh, a, a polynomial f of degree greater than zero has a root. And uh, so I've just to, without, you know, dwelling on this, a informal proof of this, uh, meaning rigorous, but not something a computer could verify, might be a page or two. It would be the slide to explain the idea, perhaps, and then the slide to work out the calculations in, in some detail. And uh, then this is a piece of the uh, proof of the statement in the linear. It's about 100 lines long, which is not so very long compared to the length of the formal proof. It's maybe four times uh, longer. And this is the uh, statement and proof of the first step of that informal theorem to say that the absolute value of f does attain its minimum at some point in the complex plane. And uh, so here's the uh, statement. Well, we're given a polynomial p. This is this line, the top line of my expression here. And the, the, there is, a, is this sum x that so for all y, p evaluated x absolute value is less than or equal to p evaluated y absolute value. So that's a you know, clear statement of attaining the uh, minimum. And uh, then this is a uh, not just rigorous, but a formal proof of that statement that can be verified all the way down to you know the definitions, which are not literally ZFC. This is based on what's called type theory, but you know certainly equivalent in the sense that it can serve as a you know rigorous and uh, completely explicit uh, foundation. And uh, you know at this point, the the, the, the main observation and and uh, it does get better if you work with this stuff, but this is not very easy to uh, read this uh, proof. And I'm, I'm not totally sure why this is fair. I believe this is still the proof in the uh, Lean Library, but I suspect one could write a, a somewhat, but not extremely clear version of this proof. And uh, so uh, so that's kind of the status of this. This is a language that is more like a computer language than a traditional language of mathematics. The statements, that one is trying to uh, formulate, you know, that one formulates in this, you know, offering as, as, as you know, goals of, 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 of proof are not that hard to formulate and to read. The, the proofs require large numbers of intermediate lemmas. That's what these names are, like exists for all LE of compact as continuous dot, dot, dot is a previously defined lemma. Uh, simp, simp A, RW, these are, these are what are called uh, tactics. So, you, you give the computer instructions. It doesn't just decide, you know, here is a sequence of uh, steps that manipulate the assumptions into the proof. Rather, you tell it at this point, let's uh, simplify using standard rules of uh, algebra, Boolean algebra, dot, dot, dot. RW means let's, let's evaluate this lemma to get a equality and then rewrite the current goal in terms of that uh, equality. And, uh, you know, it, it, there's this, some ability for the computer to uh, make suggestions and, and generate these things, but in, 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 in the end, you, you have to spell out quite a bit of it. So, uh, so that's the, uh, in a nutshell, the, the, the status of uh, you know, interactive through improving as a language for uh, you know, expressing, formalizing, verifying uh, mathematics. And there are many arguments that this really is, if you're going to try to get computers to understand mathematics in any way, as opposed to just manipulate symbols, this has to be part of it. And on the other hand, it's, it's still kind of hard to use. And uh, so one response to that, you know, very interesting was uh, Tom Hales, who was, you know, famously proved his, uh, you know, proof of the uh, Kepler conjecture verified this uh, formally. And uh, he, he, he had proposed a project called uh, Formal Abstracts, which was the idea that uh, one should uh, encourage people, you know, obviously if they can verify, if they can prove their statements and verify them, that's great. But if not, nevertheless, one could imagine something like a, a journal or a library where one at least uh, uploads by analogy to say the archive of, you know, a, formal statement of result of the uh, paper. Say, you know, here is, here is my, my theorem. I prove, you know, this formal thing. I don't necessarily give the proof, which is quite a bit harder to do. And uh, this does seem like a, a variable doable thing. And in fact, uh, 
recent talks of, of Kevin Buzzard and others have, have come somewhat in this direction. There were also various arguments that that this was not not just you know obviously only you know sidestepping some of the problems and in, in, in basing mathematics on this technology, but that also it can be hard to know that your definitions are good if you don't go a certain distance in making the uh, proof. So that was a objection, a reason why this wasn't uh, fully pursued. Uh, here are some examples. And again, Kevin Buzzard talks quite a bit more about this on uh, recent successful formalization of a uh, research level mathematics. So uh, the most famous of these was completed this, this last year. It was a something work of uh, Dustin Clausen and Peter Schultz called the liquid mathematics, okay? And condensed mathematics, which uh, I'm afraid I, I, I won't be able to explain in any depth at all. But uh, there was a point in their work where they had proven a key a technical theorem and Although the proof you know, seemed right, it was unintuitive and unconvincing to them. And so they made this challenge. There's a, a blog post of about you know, a year and a half ago with Peter Schultz. Uh, can you, know, you this, this community that works with theorem provers and lean, help me to uh, perhaps you know, verify my, my theorem, which I believe I proved? And uh, they took up this challenge. And uh, within about uh, three or four months, they had actually proven the doubtful part, you know, having assumed, you know, certain other statements when, you know, you know, coded by them without proof, but, but then the part that Schulte was not convinced about, they were able to then demonstrate that part. And so, so that was already a success. And then at, at some point during the summer, they kept going and they, they, they finished. And then one advantage of this project was that this was really, this, this, this formalism really starts out very close to the foundations. It really starts out, uh, you know, not, not assuming you know, vast numbers of existing mathematical theorems, but it's an attempt to reconceptualize the foundations. And so the, uh, one of the, you know, besides the, you know, any difficulty working with it, you know, very often research level mathematics is relying on, you know, you know, potentially, you know, books worth of uh, previously uh, defined and uh, proven statements. And so until those things are formalized, it's hard to, you know, you cannot make a uh, rigorous, uh, or I, I, mean, I mean a formal rigorous proof of a statement that depends on those, but that was not a problem here. And they were able to complete this uh, proof of uh, Schultz's and Klaus and, and Dustin Klaus theorem from the uh, foundations. And, and, and you know, again, you know, enough what range of work here, the you know, practical spaces had previously been formalized. The independence of the continuum hypothesis was uh, formalized. Uh, the uh, H principle and sphere version. This is this is something like a half done. This is uh, led by uh, Patrick Messo at uh, Orsay. Uh, Kevin Buzzard is, is has another talk where he suggests that it, it may be within reach to prove uh, to verify the part of the proof of uh, Fermat's last theorem, basically assuming that uh, the important uh, predecessor works of the the eighties and the nineties are are valid, and then you know, verifying the uh, subsequent proof of Fermat's theorem based on those. So, so it, it, the, the point's been amply made that one can express all our mathematics and given some time, you know, uh, formalize and verify, you know, non-trivial, more or less you know, any non-trivial mathematical statement. Uh, let's see, so, so, so now the, uh, I had given a list, I went over it fairly quickly of uh, ways that this, powerful technique could be made more and uh, more usable by, uh, you know, I mean, again, I've tried to use it. I, I, I have proven something, but it, it, was, it, was, it was difficult. And uh, I think uh, if this were as easy to use as, as well, compared to Mathematica, we would see a great deal of, 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 of use of this technology in the mathematical sciences. And uh, probably the best hope for that is to apply some of the progress in uh, machine learning and AI to, to this problem to automate more of the process of producing proofs. And so I've summarized uh, here a number of uh, works from up to about 2021. There are, there are a few interesting works from the last year, which I'll get to later. And uh, you know, to simplify a bit, if you go back to that slide of the proof that uh, I outlined, 
the hard parts, well, there were these tactics I mentioned that uh, you have to, your computer, at some point, you, you have to decide for each step, do I rewrite an expression? Do I use a logical simplification? Do I you know, introduce a variable or change my goal? And then there's premise selection that uh, to make each step, I could in principle use any previously proven uh, statement and there could be millions of them in my library. And for any given you know, step in the theorem, there's probably relatively few that have any chance at all of being relevant. And uh, then of course, you know, what, you know, if you get it down to a short enough list, one could search through the possibilities. And uh, so one way of thinking about this problem is that it's kind of like a solid game of solitaire. You're given the proof, you're, you're, I mean, you're given the statement, you're given the goal that you're trying to prove, and now you have these moves of, of selecting premises, bringing in these uh, rewrites and tactics and so forth. And if you complete the proof, you win your game of solitaire. And then that is very encouraging and it is, was the uh, impetus for many groups in AI to get into this because that makes it sound like uh, the gameplay that was uh, famously solved by uh, AlphaGo, AlphaZero, the reinforcement learning system that was able to uh, now, you know, by, by far the, the, the dominant uh, you know, player of Go, chess and so forth. And uh, so that was a, 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 an approach, the reinforcement learning approach trained on the previously proven corpuses of uh, theorems that have been developed for the Cox theorem prover, for the Isabel theorem prover. And uh, one can get uh, for like short, you know, like lemmas systems that can prove something like a 75% of, of the, uh, you know, so you, you, you would take your list of, you know, theorems from the database and lemmas and, you know, train on some of them and hold out others to test with, and then it would get a 75% accuracy on uh, that held out testing set. Uh, another goal which uh, starts to seem within range is to really read papers from the archive written informally. And uh, I'll, I'll come back to the uh, question in the chat in, in, in a little bit. Uh, and uh, translate these into their formal language. And in fact, uh, this is actually a, probably a good uh, segue into a later development because uh, the when I first, th these things have advanced quite a lot in the, uh, I guess it, it's now just uh, you know three years, three and a half years since I started giving this talk. And uh, so this question of auto-formalization, although not solved has, and you know, both of these questions have seen huge progress thanks to what are called uh, large language models. And uh, this you've also read about in the newspapers, but perhaps not under this uh, name, but if you've read about, for example, uh, GPT-3 is uh, the most famous example, a program that can generate stories and it's related to the infamous program that generated dialogues that a, a Google engineer uh, not long ago was fired for arguing that it was a uh, sentient. It is also related uh, you know, under the hood to a DALI, this program that can generate the uh, artworks. And what is the idea? I mean, the idea turns out to be so absurdly simple that nobody would have guessed that it would have the power that it does. So basically by a language model, one means a statistical model where you're given a text, you know, some list of words or you know tokens, if to be more precise, and then you predict a probability distribution for what's the possible next word. So, you know, where are we? Elephant has probability zero in uh, grammatical English. Where are we going? Is obviously there are many possible completions, but this is a you know relatively common completion as these things go. And then one can uh, chain you know, develop the successive uh, conditional distributions on this, and of course. It's if it's a mark if you, you could you ask if it's a Markov process and, and the answer is well not really you know in fact uh, there's a probably if you're reading a book the probability of a given word might even depend on the first word of the book you know so but uh, you know certainly depends much more strongly on the nearby words and so simply put the systems read all the text on the internet and develop such a statistical model that just predicts that every time it sees a word, what's the, what, you know, what was the probability of that next word coming out? Let's try to maximize that probability. And uh, so that's been studied for, for, for decades. And uh, then in 2017, a breakthrough was made. There was a neural network called attention that uh, has, uh, you know, without going into details, the, instead of each word 
being depending on all the words or just you know its corresponding word in the previous layer. There is a particular uh, you, you, each word is associated with a, a key embedding that in, in the simplest example is dot product with the embedding of each of the previous words and then you attend to you the input of this is uh, weighted towards those words for which that dot product is the largest and uh, dot product you know with an adjustable you know you know coefficients linear form and uh, so then uh, that allows each layer of the network then to take uh, its uh, inputs from those words which are most likely to uh, govern its own uh, probability distribution. And so here is an example of an uh, input. The animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. The animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide. Now, this is one of these tests of a limited form of uh, common sense. You know, grammatically, the sentences really match the uh, same pattern. You know, tired and wide are both adjectives, but uh, an animal can be tired. A street can be uh, wide. A street cannot be tired. A, a, a animal can be wide, but that's probably not what's being meant there. And if you look at the pattern of attention that this uh, trained model produces, it's clear. Yes, it, it is for those two different sentences, making the word it depend on the appropriate reference in the two cases. So it 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 it, it, it is able to learn quite a lot about the internal structure of language and common sense just from this predict the next word task. And uh, so again, this is uh, you know stuff of uh, newspaper articles these days. And uh, here is an example of uh, codex. So this is the uh, not breakthrough, you know, you know, grammatic application of 2021 that uh, you can give a uh, English a natural language description of a, a task that uh, you want. Uh, the uh, program to do, or you know, in some, in some cases you can also give uh, lists of examples, but uh, I, I think in this case it was actually a list of examples. And uh, so uh, it, 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 it can turn the, uh, th this one's a little ambiguous because prime, you could, you, could, you could try to assume the model knows what prime is because that's a very obviously you know, much uh, used concept in, in the uh, training set. And uh, anyways, it takes this input and it writes a program that, that determines whether the uh, number is, is prime. And it doesn't get it always right, is it? but it, it, it get it, again used in the system the way it is. It can get maybe you know 20, you know 40, up to you know 50 percent of these examples right. These systems are sufficiently good that uh, Google, for example, now the programmers use a code completion based on this and they can measure it speeds up their overall productivity by something like six or seven percent. So it's already a technology which is being used. Now, this is the example of it for uh, the uh, theorem proving case. And this is a work of uh, Alu et al. I think uh, they spoke up, I remember. And uh, so uh, this is trying to take a, a IMO, International Mathematical Olympiad, problem and that's just given up in the box up here it's a b c or the size of the triangle prove that they satisfy this uh, relation and this language model can actually generate this this answer the uh, formal proof of of the statement and uh, so it, it you know again it, it, it cannot do most of the IMO problems but it's the fact that it can do any of them I think it, I think it did two from their set is incredible you know again especially it was it was the, the underlying thing is being trained to predict the next word. So, uh, okay. So anyways, uh, it's a rapidly moving field, which uh, I think, uh, and I, 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 I would make bolder predictions than I have made in, in previous, uh, you know, versions of this uh, talk that uh, I, I would give those predictions. But uh, so, uh, so these are, you know, sort of incremental progress, the, the ones I'm talking about here. Now, I think this prediction that uh, the interactive theorem proving will be at least as easy to use as Mathematica in like five years was the kind of prediction that I was, uh, you know, making. You know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't five, you know, three years ago, it, it would have been, you know, you know, the, the you know, five to 10 year time scale. And I think that's, that's still a, a valid prediction. And uh, mathematical search, there's, again, this is at least a concept which is, is out there to try to 
understand the search not just in terms of keywords, but more conceptually or in terms of the uh, formal description of an idea. And of course, the test of that in the coming years is that you search for some, you know, the answer to some question in your own field of math, and it comes back with an answer in some different field of math, which at first doesn't look relevant, but of course, turns out it really is the answer to your question. There is some sort of a deep uh, connection or translation that uh, you, uh, you know, you, you, you learn from, from the result of this uh, search. And uh, then this was the prediction. Again, this is from three years ago that uh, there will be a computer to do that can do math at a human level. You know, again, maybe not uh, Gauss or Riemann, but but a, a, a you know interesting good human level. And uh, it's a slightly nuanced prediction. Okay, it's probably not by 2030, but. Uh, it's to say that uh, at this point, we have these uh, language models and systems that can answer questions in natural language with a, with a respectable level of accuracy, like they can get 40% of them right. I should have even mentioned, I didn't even mention it, Minerva. If you, if you look up Minerva, this is a work of the last few months by a group at Google that can literally solve math and physics on early undergraduate level of word problems at that level of accuracy, 40 and uh, 50%. And uh, if these systems can get up to the point that they can solve simple problems, okay, maybe even simpler than that one at a uh, you know, much closer, you know, to 90%, you know, you know, reliability, then within a few years after that, I, I gave the 10 year projection here, but I'm, I, again, I started to think these are conservative. Within a few years after that, you know, once you have that basic ability to do reasoning with some reliability, then what makes math different from other human domains is that you can use arbitrarily long chains of reasoning. And then of course you can correct them if uh, there are you know, you know, gaps and so forth. You can, you can actually detect the gaps and know when you've got a sound argument. So that is, Partly an argument that uh, any breakthrough of this type being able to do complicated arguments is likely to happen in uh, math before other domains. And uh, that uh, one, you know, again, it, it, I think it's no longer crazy to say this, this could happen in 10 years, maybe by 2030, you know. So, so uh, okay, so I'll, I'll stop there and uh, take questions. There's already uh, one question yeah. in the chat. Well, let's thank Mike for a beautiful talk. Okay, so, so if you have a question, raise your hand, but Mike, you can go ahead and repeat the one in the chat. Sure. Okay, Andres Kalanucci, has anyone tried to use AI or ML to come up with a more intuitive proof of the map coloring problem, by which I, I assume you mean the uh, four color problem, the four color theorem. And uh, I think uh, at this point that would be that, that would probably be considered uh, too hard. So I think uh, people have not at this point caught up with, uh, you know, the, these, these famous, you know, the four color verification, the, uh, you know, Thomas Hales verification and so forth. But that is something that, uh, you know, at least some people I talk about, you know, I, I talk to, you know, talk about trying to do those things in the coming years. Yes, but I think as, as of yet, that, 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 that's a hard one, yeah. Harder than Thanks, Frank. Thank you. So Arka Das, I don't know how to pronounce, sorry, yeah. has a question. Uh, I, I thank you for the beautiful talk. Uh, it was a very nice summary of a wide range of things. Uh, I don't know if you have been following Michael Harris's Substack, probably yes, or? Um, I didn't, I, 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 I may have looked a bit at it, but no, okay. I didn't. Okay. One, one issue that, um, he seems to be pessimistic uh, yeah. or, or optimistic, depending on your viewpoint right. uh, about is that uh, he, he says, you know, a lot of math is actually not proving theorems, but actually making the right definitions. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, uh, he says, I mean, he, he, he doesn't, it, it, it seems not likely that that sort of thing uh, would be done beautifully by um, uh, automated theorem proofs or anything like that anytime soon, but do, do you at least see a path towards something like that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do see a path towards doing that. I mean, again, that's less analogous. I mean, you can certainly formulate the question in terms of these uh, theorem improvers, but it is a, a different question than the one that uh, 
the main line of work I was talking about here, you know, I mean, uh, but, uh, you know, there are other programs. It's, 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 more, it's more analogous and more the kind of thing you would think about in this reinforcement learning approach where uh, if the goal is to answer a question, then, you know, intermediate definitions are a kind of a move one can make. One try, can try to make, you know, definitions to help solve a problem. And then if you look at a larger, you know, landscape or large, you know, corpus of problems, then there can be definitions that are good at solving many problems that are good at, uh, you know, grouping and uh, organizing the, uh, the the space of concepts. So there are definitely ways forward to this, but uh, I agree if you stand back and 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 and, and look at the results so far and and, and, and haven't uh, looked at the, uh, you know, the, the, the wide range of things in, in AI, I can see where you, you could certainly maintain that position at this point, but I think we will and 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 uh, it, it is also true. I think when I said what what can these things do in ten years, I that's right. I I, I I I am not sure that they will be highly creative. I mean, there's all kind of, one can make many analogies. You know, I mean, I think uh, we will still we, you know, certainly they will they will be better at uh, working. You know, completing a, a partially uh, done theorem. You know, than of coming with a you know, a great new definition for quite a while, but uh, I think ultimately this is incorrect, and that uh, the, these are also, uh, you know, these are not, they they are they are more like other areas of of AI and and, and problem solving, but other areas where there has has also been success, and I don't think there's any, you know, fundamental reason to think that this is, you know, so much harder. Okay, Thank Jeffrey you. Winkler has a few questions in the chat. How might you go about finding the point in the string theory landscape that corresponds to the standard model? Okay, well, that's a uh, obviously a question for a different uh, talk, and it's a very hard problem that many people uh, work on. There's probably more than one such point, so I, I don't have time to do it justice. And, okay, uh, and then quantum. One last question: um, What will be the impact of quantum computers? Right. Right. Uh, well, that's a, again, that's a different thing, which uh, I think I'm, you know, most people, although, you know, you do hear many opinions, but, uh, you know, many people think that uh, to get a quantum computer that can do any calculation, you know, anything, even a fraction of the size of what we're talking about here, you know, if you're, you're recognizing, you know, digits, you know, like the, the original deep learning problems is going to be a multi-decade project. You know, it's what, 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 what people expect to have in the coming decade is, uh, you know, systems that, that are, are very noisy, that, that maybe can usefully simulate, you know, very symmetric physical systems, you know, like a, a 2D lattice in the Hubbard model or like a atom, you know, with a, a few interesting states. Uh, there's a, you know many other interesting applications of this, this quantum technology. And there's a you know project now to you know conceive and build a, a quantum internet, which has its own you know purposes. Uh, I again I think on this 2030 timescale, the, the answer to you know is, is, is no quantum computers will not meaningfully engage with these problems. But uh, over you know a 50 year timescale, perhaps yes. Okay, well, let's thank Mike again for. Um, sharing uh, all those provocative and wonderful thoughts with us. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Do you want to discuss more? I, I do have a little more time if people want. What did you mention at the end? You said something about Google solving uh, kind of yeah, undergraduate. Yeah, I, I should add that. Like I said, I'm, I'm still in progress of updating the talk. There is a, uh, if, you, if you search on the uh, arch archive for Minerva, you know, spelled like the, uh, you know, the, the Roman goddess, then okay. uh, you will find this, uh, you know, That's the, the name system that can solve yeah. problems, yeah. Yeah, I saw, a little demonstration of GPT, is that what it's called? Solving yeah, yeah, a difficult GPT, yeah, problem, yeah, which was yeah. quite impressive, I got to say. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And you can play I mean, with I it. I guess you had to try it 50 times, but it did come up. Yeah, with... that's right. That's right. It says uh, some of these things are done by, you know, producing many, many solutions and then, you know, doing doing things where you can, uh, you know, validate. You can pick out 
the correct solution in some way. That this this codex, this program writing thing is like that. So uh, you know, uh, but you you can actually play with uh, GPT three and then in codex. If you type a uh, open AI uh, API into Google, you'll find yeah, no, it. I, I, I yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. it's um... yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's impressive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Far beyond what I thought existed. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that, but, but it's it, really it, 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 moving it's, fast. It, yeah. It, 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 that's right. I mean, it, it's it's just, it's about GPT three is at most two years old. You know, it's, it's, it's moving very fast. So they'll have a new version, undoubtedly. <laughs> that's right. No, they are working on GPT four. There are you know definite rumors about it. It's interesting because people mostly say that GPT four will have fewer parameters than GPT-3. It turns out- What do you mean by parameters? So these neural networks, you know, it's it's, it's like ah. uh, you know, matrices times vectors and nonlinear stuff. And so each matrix element, each, each adjustable number that it learned in the model. So GPT-3 has something like 170 billion parameters. And uh, the rumor is that GPT-4 has uh, still billions, but fewer that it turns out to be more efficient to uh, have a smaller model and train it longer. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Mike, are there parts of math that um, you think will be will not be amenable to um, to to this sort of analysis? Um, uh, well, yeah. I I mean. Uh, I mean, I, I think the short answer is, is 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 no. I mean, of course, my 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 talk was kind of wide ranging, and I covered <clears throat> several different uh, technologies, you know. And uh, I, uh, you know, clearly you can you can formalize all of math. I mean, if, if you can't, then it's sort of not math the, the way most people would phrase or, it. Yeah, or yeah. or I guess more more broadly, science. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, well, that's right. So, no, no, science is a more interesting question. That's right. So, like, are there what what are you know? things that you can't formalize. Now, do we think that, uh, say, these language models will be able to answer questions ultimately in you know, medical or in uh, economics or whatever? And uh, I think that's much less clear because there definitely are reasoning abilities different from logic that they, you know, certainly if you start talking about, you know, you know, of course, general human interactions, but even, you know, like you know, economics, you know, business, I mean, uh, you know, law, you know, there, you know, there are definitely other styles of, of reasoning that are, you know, also, you know, very important. You know, logic's important, but they're also very important. And so I, I again, I, I wouldn't say that these, uh, you know, hold out some sort of uh, insuperable barrier, but I, I certainly would be sympathetic to, to, to think that, you know, that they're different and these things will take longer and they will take different breakthroughs. Yeah. Minyo? Uh, yeah, no, well, it's a slight variant on Tudor's questions, uh, uh, but um, will the machines experience hardness in mathematics similar to us, do you think? For example, I mean, there are many kinds of hardness, but in mathematics, sometimes we feel like certain kinds of areas or problems are more sophisticated and require higher level reasoning than others. Yeah. Do you yeah. think machines will care at all about this? Yeah, um, my guess is that they would. I mean, it's really too early to know. I mean, people have all sorts of different uh, intuitions. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I, I uh, when, uh, there was, uh, I mean, for example, one of the intuitions that you know people expressed for quite a while, and I, I, this was even in you know, go to lecture Bach, you know, Douglas Hofstadter's book was this idea that you know maybe the machine will come up with these very long, you know, rigorous, but impenetrable proofs. You know, you'll come up with this proof mm -hmm. of the Riemann hypothesis, which is, you know, again, 200 terabytes long and just, you know, has no structure and, you know, who knows what it means. And, uh, you know, then then I've also heard, there's, for example, a talk by Abaya Venkatesh, you know, you know, holding at least, you know, the, the, the idea that maybe the machine will really come up with a simpler proofs than humans. It will yeah. make more connections than humans do. So I think it's really much too early to know what it, what it will think is, uh, easy and, and hard in these things. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna be fascinating just to see, you know, how similar and how different it is, but it definitely could be different. It definitely, these, these language models are already, again, they don't, they don't, they're, they're certainly not sentient, you know, there's a limit of what they can do, but they can already do things that are 
vaguely human-like and then they do things differently, you know? So it is already, you know, kind of interesting to play and see, you know, what, what are they doing? So I think there'll they'll, they'll be even more the case. It may turn out that they, you know, just, and they, you know, of course, AlphaGo people and AlphaZero people have made the same comment. You know, it plays uh, differently and more more intuitively than the previous uh, Go mm -hmm. playing machines and people are finding that even just kind of trying to copy its style, you know, is, 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 a, is a fruitful thing to do. So, uh, yeah, I, I, th I think we will, we will see discoveries like this. Maybe it will do mathematics in some interestingly different way. Mm, thank you. I, I was also curious about how you actually started thinking about this domain. Like, how did you already have a background in the past? Or yeah, yeah. There's, 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 there's a story that I, I tell everybody that uh, when I I went to graduate school, I started in 1983 at uh, Caltech, and uh, of course in 1983 I had never heard of string theory and the reason I went to Caltech was to work with uh, John Hopfield on uh, neural networks. This was like a very new thing back then. And uh, so, so I, 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 I went into and I took his course and I, I took this course by Richard Feynman, which was on, uh, it was the first, it was on a lot about, you know, computing and physics, but in particular, he had several lectures on quantum computers. And it was I think, probably the first place where this was, this was lectured on. And uh, so I, I had this great year and then and, and for, for reasons I don't totally remember it, I, I at the end of this year kind of said, you know, this this neural network in both of these things, but this neural network stuff is, 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 is pretty cool, but it's going to be quite a while before it really turns into something, you know, that I, I could, you know, work on. And uh, then, of course, that was the summer of 1984. And then that, that, that came this, uh, came this uh, Green Schwartz anomaly cancellation. And so I, I, I got back in the fall and like half of the Caltech physics students were working on string theory now. And so then I, I switched, but uh, I, I did keep up and I kept talking to people doing AI and computer science and even you know, neural networks and these things. So I do kind of know the history of it from, from, from way back. And uh, so uh, then, uh, yeah, I did, I did follow it at, at some level. And uh, in 2012, I, I, I went for again, a variety of reasons to uh, Renaissance Technologies. And there you can imagine we use quite a bit of uh, machine learning. So that was a chance to catch up in, in, in more depth. So, and, and, and then, you know, I, I think it was really AlphaGo as, as with many people convinced me that this was just some sort of you know, revolution starting, so. Thank you. Sure. All right. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to have to go, but okay. you guys can okay, stay. Yeah. Yeah. But, thanks a lot for giving this talk. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that Thank was wonderful. You. Great. Oh, Mike, if you could send your slides to um, I don't know, to Dave Morrison. Maybe. Okay, I will. I may I may go over them a few a little more. Like I said, they're a little rough, but uh, okay. Yeah, I will. That'd be great. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right. Take care, everybody.